So aid workers and veterans are cultural strangers, but very much like the connections formed at a bar in the minutes before closing time, they have just enough in common to decide the other is good enough to spend the night with. <laughs> I had been a contract aid worker for UNICEF for five years before getting injured during an attack in South Sudan. I didn't even notice I'd been hurt at the time because of all the adrenaline, but the next day I felt a searing pain when I rubbed my left eye. Mirrors weren't common around our compound, but when I found one, an obvious splinter of wood about a fourth of an inch long greeted me, sticking straight out of my fucking iris. I showed all my friends this during lunch because entertainment was hard to come by and this counted as entertainment. And then I pulled it out. We're gonna be friends after the show, just wait. After I pulled it out, nobody could tell that there was anything wrong with me. It was invisible, but from my perspective, a new black hole swallowed a portion of my vision. And since I was a contract employee, as far as the UN was concerned, my health was my responsibility. So my plan was I would fly back to San Diego, I would get my eye checked out, and then apply for the next big emergency that the UN was taking unmarried, childless people like me for, Afghanistan. It was still very fucking dangerous there. And my peers, who were not, you know, experienced, felt that for non-combatants it wasn't a good idea. But UNICEF's executive director had been appointed by Bush Jr. And if you owed the cowboy a favor, you were back in the global war on terror. <laughs> yeah! But, not long after I'd been back in the States, the Taliban hit the UNICEF compound in Kabul with their whole party bucket, including suicide vests. They killed five out of the 30 of our people stationed there. Genetic testing had to be used to make final identifications. I decided to make a career change. <laughs> On paper, I was just in between jobs. In reality, I had had my tribe, my entire world of friends, replaced with crushingly lonely survivor's guilt, and eventually a diagnosis for the four little letters that really spice up dating life, PTSD. Like many people with that diagnosis, though, the big bad things that weren't what they fucked me up. It was the isolation afterwards that made my teeth itch a manufactured schizophrenia where one half of my life had become a stranger to the other. In truth, I'd slept like a baby no matter what happened in South Sudan because everybody I knew was experiencing the same reality as me. I mean, hell, after I pulled the splinter out of my eye, our security officer slapped me upside the head and told me to stop blocking clubs with my face. And we all had a good laugh about it and then went back to work. Back in the States, nobody I knew could find Sudan on a map. One hot little idiot I met in a bar asked me where in South America it was located. <laughs> my dick told my brain it was gonna go wait in the car until I decided to do the right thing and drive it home. I became a stereotype of sorts. I would drink too much, I would get manic, I'd overshare gruesome details at parties. I was ashamed to talk about being injured because there was no evidence of it. I was embarrassed I hadn't acted quicker with more unthinking violence, prevented more people from getting hurt, guilty I hadn't de been deployed longer and accomplished more. I would have paid anything for one of those ridiculous anime scars over my eye, something that just wordlessly said, that guy's been in the shit. So instead, I jumped into volatile situations, confronting assholes, pulling over for freeway car crashes, getting into it with belligerent drunks in a bar, just trying to get an adrenaline hit and feel brave again. My therapist told me to seek out a new community, one, in cl one closest in character to the one I had lost. And growing up in a military family, I knew vets. 
I started the Veteran Writers Division, helping craft and showcase the true stories from those who had served. And it was easy to recruit for back in 2014. I just had to ask my community college professor friends which one of their freshmen were 10 years older than everybody else and had full <laughs> sleeve tattoos. <laughs> After being raised in the silence of our Vietnam parents and World War II grandparents, my generation was actually primed to overshare by comparison. Turning individual trauma into a shared experience shifted this narrative from why are all these fucked up vets killing themselves into an angrier and healthier indictment of our culture and its dependence on their exploitation. It wasn't therapy, it was catharsis. And I felt like the different acts of my life were finally coming together in one narrative. We started this NPR show called Incoming and heard from a woman as far away as Charleston, South Carolina, about how she'd listened to it with her Vietnam vet father, and he'd been prompted to share things that he never had with her before. And then one day, I was called to the KPBS to be interviewed by Robin Young, the host of NPR's show, Here and Now, Give It Up! We talked about the importance of civilians being connected to their military, regardless of their stance on the wars, because in a democracy, everyone's culpable. And how the idea that the armed forces aren't connected somehow to the shoppers at the mall is just a bourgeois illusion. I got to say bourgeois. <laughs> she played a clip from the show. We stuck the landing. It was nice. That went well, don't you think, she said. And when she got up to leave, I stood to shake her hand, and she held on to it. Listen, you've chosen to immerse yourself in a world of darkness. And that's important, but it'll come for you if you don't take care of yourself. So take care of yourself. And then she was gone. <laughs> like a plot device. <laughs> of course I knew what she was talking about. Secondary trauma, hearing about the worst days of people's lives constantly had a tendency to creep into the subconscious and make the world seem void of light. And of course, not everyone we worked with was a perfect, tragic hero. Far from it. There were plenty of vets that NPR liberals would have cared about from the safety of their cars, but sidestepped sharing a meal with. People like Bob. Bob was a dirtbag. But it was just such an open and uncontestable fact about him that it became normalized pretty quickly. By the time I met him, Bob had caught a felony for beating up his wife and threatening his children, one of the most common charges, common as the cold. But he'd been able to get a deferment to vet court and into a treatment facility. Over the years we worked together, we cried about our dead friends, we made good art, we were buddies. And six years into knowing each other, I asked him and some other vets to help me move our friend, Jennifer, out of her apartment and hang out in our backyard, in my backyard, once it was done. After the second beer, Bob started a monologue about wanting to go fight in Ukraine. A lot of good people, including volunteers from the US, UK, Norway, and more, were fighting and dying over there. Marines like him were dying over there. He missed his tribe. Life can be beautifully simple in war. You don't think about bills or what you wear, or what you eat. You just care about the people who care about you and not fucking up. But this was a fantasy. Our knees sounded like firecrackers. We both needed glasses to read the labels on our prescription bottles, much less canoe a Russian conscript's head at 20 yards. <laughs> we were old men now, and he had two sons. Nobody in Ukraine wanted or needed his body. And I think he knew that. 
The sky was blue when I told him as much. And the next thing I knew, I was laying on my back, staring up at a pitch black sky alone. I wondered at this sudden transition why it was so dark. And then I felt this familiar hot, wet coating sliding down my face. Jennifer was yelling somewhere to someone to lock the doors. I wobbled inside to grab a weapon out of an instinct I hadn't felt in a long time, and I caught sight of myself in the bathroom mirror. And there it was, finally, the impossible to deny, face-altering wound I had always hoped would erase the imposter syndrome I had felt since Sudan. But it wasn't a war injury. It wasn't something I'd suffered while being brave. It was nonsense. Jennifer and my neighbor's son, Peyton, rushed in. They told me Bob had sucker punched me back in my chair where I'd hit my head against the bricks and then just kept jackhammer punching me while I was down. When Jennifer threw all 108 pounds of her between me and him, he'd thrown her into a tangerine tree, slicing up her back. Peyton jumped the fence and Bob picked up a log that was laying beside my fire pit to hit him with it, but Jen just kept telling him, just leave, just leave. And eventually he did, like a Terminator, Peyton had said. And together they got me into Jen's car and onto the emergency room. A nice man who was high off all the drugs <laughs> waved me to go ahead of him. <laughs> That's how you know it's bad. 25 stitches, a broken nose, and a concussion. $3,000 out of pocket to Kaiser with insurance. During the interminable waiting, a cop appeared at the foot of the bed and told Jen and I that Bob was going to be arrested regardless of whether we wanted to press charges or not. They just had to find him. And I said, don't kill him. I was convinced Bob was going to go on a full suicide by cop mission. I said, Bob had severe PTSD. He's having a breakdown. This is textbook. And my cop nodded, and then he shook his head. Nope. I didn't know what the fuck that meant <laughs> at all. But I took it to mean that nobody knew what was going to happen next. A doctor came in, she sewed up my right eye, asking me three times if I wanted it numbed, but, for, but I refused for a reason that felt incredibly important at the time, but I still couldn't explain to you. Jen took me home, I finished my beer that was still sitting upright next to my overturned chair by the blood on the pavement, and then I stayed there for months. I'd spent nearly 14 years at that point evangelizing about the importance of people unburdening themselves of shame and guilt by divulging the truth of their lives to an audience of strangers. And I didn't tell fucking anybody I didn't have to. I felt incompetent that I hadn't been able to anticipate how unstable Bob had become, embarrassed that I let another man get the better of me, and absolutely did not want to reinforce that stereotype that all combat vets were just fucked up violent and unhinged. But I also hated the state of my entire fucking life. My friends had kids, marriages, sometimes more than one, retirement savings, vacation plans. I was 41 years old, had my head cracked open in my own backyard, and now was in medical debt. I didn't like myself very much. When a buddy of mine's birthday rolled around, instead of going, I just sent him a birthday card made from the picture I'd taken of myself after the attack, photoshopped as a Black Album metal cover. <laughs> I really thought this was one of my greatest visual fucking artistic <laughs> achievements of my entire life. <laughs> you have your moments. He didn't think it was that very funny. <laughs> So afterwards, I worked from home. I drank alone, even though the doctor had told me not to, and I stared out the window for hours, thinking about nothing. A prolonged fugue state is what somebody I wouldn't like might call it. 
I felt like the head injury was partially responsible, but the symptoms were also what a middle-aged man experiencing a midlife crisis might just exhibit on a Tuesday. It was hard to tell what was what. But I didn't mind. It felt more contemplative than traumatic at that point. What was the point of it all? Was there a point? There better be a fucking point. The stitches came out after the first couple of weeks, and months later, the scars receded among the collection of worry lines that I'd already amassed, erasing any sign of what had caused them. And it was fine. There was an end of an era about it all, nothing that needed proving, no illusion of control left to maintain. It was weird that it was fine, but by that point, I'd worked with so many people who'd been where I was, the road, ahead <laughs> the road ahead was pretty well marked. We'd been giving out the advice I needed to take for so long, it was kind of funny. Just go find the people who will stick around long enough to tell a story to, and then do that until it makes sense, and then keep doing it until you're sick of it. And then let it fade away. And make room for a new one. Thank you. Justin Hudnall, ladies and gentlemen, Justin.